Um, good evening, welcome to this evening's discussion. I'm Adam Lewis Smythe, the senior curator at Bluco in Liverpool, the UK's oldest art centre. Um, this evening forms part of a body of work by artist and filmmaker Baffa Koto called Uprise, a groundbreaking nationwide augmented reality public artwork exploring the pathology, history and underlying drivers of English civil unrest in a digital age. Marking the 10th anniversary of the August 2011 UK riots in inverted commas, um, Uprise launched on August the 6th um, via QR codes located nationwide in communities where incidents of unrest were recorded in the summer of 2011, which includes Liverpool, um, which is where I am at Luco at the moment. Akoto's Uprise exhibition is accompanied by community workshops and a conversation series bringing together artists and thought leaders with community and youth voices to explore the themes of the work, delving into how digital networks connect marginalised people and shape real world mass descent. In addition to Bath's amazing augmented reality work, um, he's also launched Uprise TV, a 19 hour pirate, uh, telev television piece the work serves as a critical commentary on the reductive, simplifying and voyeuristic instincts of the broadcast news. And this is really juxtaposed with the augmented reality work itself, which features the voices of many of the people who were convicted following um, the 2011 uprising. At Blue Coat, we're working with Okoto to also commission a Liverpool-based artist, actor and rapper Blue Saint to create a new digital commission featuring interviews from local artists, activists and creatives, which was, has been filmed and is currently being filmed during the lead up to Uprise, um, and that will be launched on the 21st of August. Um, we're really obviously really interested in Bath as an exciting artist um, who's both pushing boundaries in terms of the technology he uses to make his work, but also in terms of the content of his work um, and in cover uncovering really important histories that haven't been spoken about enough. Um, for tonight, our chair will raise questions to a panelist of artists, cultural organizers and researchers relating to the themes of, of the Uprise project. Following the conversation um, with the panel, we'll also address questions from the audience. Um, and if you'd like to raise any questions, please use the Q&A box, which is um, just at the bottom on the kind of right hand tab. Um, so if you put your questions in there, then we'll read those out, um, as many of them as we can, um, at the end um, and hear those. Um, so I'm now going to um, hand over to our and introduce our chair for tonight. Um, Belanley Tajuddin is the founder of Black Boston's, an expanded curatorial platform showcasing contemporary Black, non-binary artists and Black women in the most inclusive sense since 2015. She's also a lead tutor of art, art in the Black, Black. Sorry, I'll start that again. The lead, she's also a lead tutor of art in the age of Black girl magic, an in-depth course on Black women artists. In 2020, Blando launched the Black Blossoms School of Art and Culture, an e-learning platform that aims to decolonize, deconstruct, and de democratize creative learning. Um, so I'll hand over now. Hello, Adam, and welcome, everybody. Thank you for the lovely introduction, Adam, and welcome, everybody, to tonight's event. Um, before we start, I'm going to introduce our amazing panellists, and I'm going to ask the panellists one by one um, as I introduce them to switch on their cameras. Adam Elliott Cooper is a research associate in a sociology at University of Greenwich, Greenwich and is in, an incoming lecturer in public policy at Queen Mary's University. He sits on the board of the Monitoring Group, a grassroots organized organization challenging state racism. He is an, he is an author of Black Resistance to British Policing. Nika, Nika Jonah is a cultural producer and development strategist. Strategist. She's currently, she is currently a visiting research fellow at Central School of Speech and Drama. Until recently, she is the lead for Pop Change, a pop culture and social change initiative at CounterPoints Arts. In 2018, she launched Pan-African Creative Pace, a platform for artists based in Africa. Between 2008 and 2012, Nika led the, the Decibel Program, an Arts Council England initiative for African, Asian and Caribbean artists in England. Nika is a trustee of the European Cultural Foundation, the Birmingham Contemporary Music Group and the Royal African Society, as well as Bush Theatre. 
Fazia, Fazia, Fazia Johnson is a freelance curator, artist, producer, and writer based in Liverpool. She focuses her work on raising awareness around mental health, queerness, anti-racism, debt abolishment, architecture, and architecture and institutional and racist inequalities. She is currently create, curating soft boys at Factor Liverpool. Leroy Cooper, who I'm so delighted to have on the panel tonight, is an artist, poet, photographer, and musician based in Liverpool. When Leroy Cooper was a young child growing up in the South, south in the South End in the 60s, he and his mates would play in the bomb bombidies, the burnt out shells of buildings left derelict since World War II. When he returned to LA in September 1981, after six weeks on remand following his infamous arrest, the place he found looked like more of a war zone than it did when a youngster playing among when when he was a youngster playing amongst the ruins ruins. Leroy threw a rock or a petrol bomb, never charged at the police. Sorry, Leroy never threw a rock or a petrol bomb, bomb, never charged at the police. He was not there. As the neighborhood burned, burned during the successive weekends of rampage and his only experience of the mayhem was in the media. It was bitterly iconic for him that his name will forever be linked to the riots, like, al al like an albatross around his neck. Thank you and welcome all to the panel tonight. You can all switch on your cameras now. <laughs> Hello. Hey. So, um, you know, I'm so delighted to be um, leading this discussion tonight um, and thinking back to 10 years ago when um, the riots were taking place, uh, it really took me back to a time where I was, I was thinking, where was, where did I hear about the riots? And I was thinking, did I hear about it on the TV? Was it through BBM? Was it through Twitter? And I've got a feeling it was actually through Facebook. And I was wondering, um, Adam, do you remember where you were when you heard about the riots? Um, and what kind of political engagement did you have at the time? So um, when the 2011 riots happened, I was working as a youth worker um, in Hackney in North East London. And I guess my immediate concern was a lot of the young people that we were working with um, being affected by the massive increase in searches, in arrests, in raids on people's homes, in instances of brutality um, that were likely to arise following um, the unrest. And I guess those kind of concerns were probably came out of the experiences that we already had working with young people there, as well as my own personal experiences. Um, many of the young people we worked with had also had already experienced a lot of quite violent and racist policing. And in the two years leading up to the unrest, we, there was a police operation called Operation Blunt 2, which saw a massive increase in what are called Section 60 searches, which allow the police to stop and search people without requiring what's called reasonable suspicion. A project's very similar to the infamous Sus laws, which led to the 1981 rebellions. And those concerns were, I think, well-founded. Um, and uh, I've started to get involved with a number of what are called community defence campaigns um, in the aftermath of the unrest, which sought to try to defend young people from the increase in policing that emerged um, uh, in the, the weeks and months after the disturbances. Uh, you're on mute, I think. Thank you, Adam. Um, Leroy? Um, you've got probably perspective on a couple of riots and I was wondering has your political engagement changed over time with each one of the incidences? I'll be honest, in 1981, I was 19 going on 20, I was having the time of my life, freshly newly independent, own home, flat, and the incident that I was involved in had uh, catastrophic ripples down through my life. When 2011 happened, again, the way it was projected through the media, that they were all just young thugs. There's very little mention about Mark Duggan, about, there's very little in the media about stop and search, the rates of institutional racism within the police force. So again, I think the world was given a warped and twisted 
version of what happened. And I think this, the similar warped, twisted version of what happened in 81, the 81 uprisings was a similar thing. So we saw no change from the media, but what was different in 2011 was the social media response and the social media connectivity between different people across the country and across the world at that time. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think um, I was 21 at the time and I was actually a new mum. So I remember not being able to like fully go out on the street because I was literally cradling my newborn baby, but I was feeling like very, very angry at all the media coverage that I was seeing through my phone. Um, probably not really engaging with the news like through a TV screen anymore at that time but definitely knowing that there was a bias in the reporting. Um, so I really, um, what you both, Adam and Levo have both said, I see it from like the injustice kind of, just like social injustice and feeling like unable to have the truth be told through it, as well as like all the legal kind of political implications that had led to that very moment. Nika, um, do you remember where you were in the world at the time? Hi, um, I was actually living in Wolverhampton, and I remember the night before, the night it happened actually, a friend had come to visit me and I lived literally just most probably a five minute drive. So I said, oh, I'll drop you home thinking it would be a quick, it would be a quick drop off. I ended up having to go all the way around and I could, it's only when I got home, I found out what had happened. So yes, I, I, was, I was in London and um, I remember I had quite a few friends that lived around there and how angry they were about the way they were portrayed, the way um, half truths were told, how, we didn't hear from the taxi driver. We didn't hear from the other passenger in the car. Um, furthermore, I don't know if people are aware that actually the family have appealed to the police and they lost their appeal just last month. So it's it's been stirred up again. So yeah, I was right literally around the corner. <laughs> Thank you. And Fazia? Yeah, so at the time in 2011, I was 14. Um, so it was fairly young, so it was quite a scary time for me because I didn't quite understand what was going on. Um, in general, I, I don't know. All I remember is that along, I, I was living in an area called Ravenry in Liverpool, which is semi-close semi, semi close to L8 and L7. Um, and I just remember seeing the burnt out car like in the morning, but I don't know what day that was, but it was just along Lawrence Road. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I remember. In, in regards to like political beliefs, like my family is very left wing, um, and so is Liverpool in general. So, yeah. Thank you so much. So, um, alongside Uprising, the augmented reality artwork, Bath has curated Uprise TV, which is a nineteen-hour private pirate television piece. The work serves as a critical commentary on the inherently reductive simplifying and voyeuristic instinct of broadcast news and the limitations of the medium when faced with complex societal causes of acute civil dissent and unrest. So earlier on today, I spent some time watching the pirate television piece and I was really imp impressed by the co 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 collation of news pieces from the UK and also international news channels. At the time, like I've mentioned before, I definitely consumed the public unrest through social media, but re-watching the coverage re-sparked the anger I felt about how black working class young people were talked about in the media. One of the journalists said, areas in the UK are essentially ghettos because of high immigration. Another news channel chose to frame the riots on the backdrop of the two wars, um, the two wars that were happening in Iraq and Afghanistan, positioning the unrest as political mismanagement of using public money to fund wars rather than investing in, heavy, in heavier handed policing tactics in Britain, with little mention to the cuts to youth services. 
Leroy, as someone who experienced the 1981 Toxic uprisings purely through the media, do you see any differences in how the media portrayed the 2011 uprising? I think they've politicized it against black working class, white working class, those people who showed dissent. That's why I said to, I don't really think most of those youngsters there were, were there because of two wars. I think they were there because, yeah, of the social and lack of resources and empathy in their situations, being unemployed, being stigmatized, living in ghettos. And the right-wing media frames things how they want Middle England to receive it, mm. how they want Middle England that's been brought up on the Great British Empire fallacy to receive information. That's why, as I said, the advent of social media, even though it might have been in certain networks, other people had other narratives and other explanations and versions of what was going on and why it was going on that weren't present in the mainstream media. Thank you, Fauzia. Fauzia. Um, I was wondering what you thought about last year's kind of um, commentary from media the media around the BLM marches across the country, particularly particularly Bristol. In regards to um, in social media's presence, so much stronger than it was back in the day. Um, so last year, you know, people using Instagram, Facebook, even like, you know, closed platforms such as WhatsApp to kind of organise things and make things happen for the better. And I think you know, in regards to like, if you look back at 2011, if you wanted to buy a smartphone, I'm pretty sure it, it would cost you a lot more money than if you wanted to buy one now, it'd be about £30. If you wanted, then you can go to Wi-Fi hubs and get free Wi-Fi there. Um, I, I don't know, I feel like it's, people have been able to control and take more accountability of what they say online. Um, whereas back in the day, it wasn't necessarily, um, like you you know you could be anonymous and you can post anonymous threads but now people even if they do want to get into activism like the activism in bristol they could use vpms if they're scared of like their employers are gonna you know clap back at them in some way there's still kind of like that fear um but it's more i don't know it's it's more um accepted now in some way just for some young people they feel a little bit fearful mm. Yeah, I think um, it's, when you look at Blackberry Messenger, it was probably one of the first kind of encrypted kind of um, messaging services that young people had. And at the time, I think to get a Blackberry in 2011, it was like £100, £120. And then like we all had the five day passes. So we were all like online all the time. <laughs> um, Adam, do you remember having a BBM? I do remember having a BBM at the time, um, and I think it was I think it was a really powerfully quite subversive form of technology um, that was being used by these young people. And I think we we kind of see um, that kind of subversive use of technology continuing today. It isn't so much BBM that's being used by young people to not be uh, constantly surveilled and monitored with, with regards to their digital communications. Um, but we see so-called burner phones being used very often by young people um, who are trying to come not completely off grid, but less on the grid by using um, uh, the internet less and using just normal, quite cheap mobile phones in order to communicate with each other. And while the police will always frame this as suspicious, you know, why don't you want us monitoring you? You must be up to something if you don't want GCHQ and the police to monitor your digital communications. I think there's a lot of listeners here for ordinary people who don't want to live in a surveilled society, who want to have freedom and liberties from being monitored. Um, and I think that we can learn a lot from these young people, whether it be the use of encrypted messaging services like BBM 10 years ago, or the use of more rudimentary forms of technology today, which is more difficult for uh, the state security services to uh, monitor and surveil. 
thank you. And Nika, at the time, how did you see BBM playing um, a role amongst your peers and maybe young people around you? Um, I remember my cousins writing to me and sending me a message from Nigeria saying all the spots where these sort of like riots or uprisings were going to happen. And I kept saying, how, how do you know all of this? And I realized that she had recently moved back to Nigeria and her son was there and her son was sending things through. And then of course, when I followed the news, I realized that they got all the locations right. But I also realized that even amongst Nigerians, a lot of the ways that they would communicate even with any kind of government messaging or anything they needed to get across for a long time, it was through BBM. So it's, it's something that's been used in other parts of the world quite frequently because it's a necessity to be able to get clear communication. So amongst your family network, but also the government network would say, oh, there's flooding in such parts of Lagos, don't go there. I remember one time there was an explosion in Lagos and getting the messaging through and getting panicked and then, you know, realizing that this was one of the ways that they communicated. So amongst my peers, it, I, I guess it was early WhatsApp, wasn't it? It was early WhatsApp groups and you felt still connected to family and community beyond the UK. So yeah, it's something that up until recently, I remember seeing Barack Obama, um, just as he was leaving office, he was still in the Blackberry system. And remember there was the, there was, there was the, um, there was a huge fight with the American government and Apple saying we are not going to breach people's confidentiality and privacy because I think the government in America at one point had asked them to get hold of somebody's messaging. But you, you feel, I, I, I'm really mindful what I put out even on WhatsApp, on social media, because I know one time I had an interview at um, for a visa and I saw that they'd gone on my Facebook page. And one of my sister's friends who worked for Microsoft, she had some huge job over there. And she said, look, they send people online to check you out when you, you're going for these interviews or you're going for certain jobs and things like that. So it's always made me a little bit cautious as to what I put down. You'll never find absolutely everything about me online. You have to meet me and know me to get the full, the full whack because I'm really mindful that how things are being used you know <clears throat> thank you so much i think yeah we could go on to talk about the use of voice and clubhouse how that's going to be used in the future and all of this data that we are like willingly putting online but i don't want to digress too much but maybe we'll pick up um, on that at the end um i wanted to ask back to um i keep fusia can you Hello, yes, who's here? Who's here? <laughs> so um, you, you're the youngest on the panel <laughs> and I guess like your relationship with the 2011 rights are a bit different and your relationship, your generation's relationship with social media is different. And in that, do you believe that there's a distrust in the media and maybe somewhat of a tr like a trust more in social media and how has it helped you grow your platform rooted zine? I feel like, yes, mainstream media, so like the top five kind of like news stations and everything, they have to appease, of course, like the people at the top and the people at the top don't look like um, us. They're going to have the same, um, you know, financial situation, cultural situation. Um, so I, kind of like accessing those platforms in order to get the actual truth out from the communities can be quite difficult. Um, in regards to social media, it's become a lot more simple. You know, you can get an email and simply sign in and then just share and use hashtags to kind of network with everyone. And there's other independent platforms as well, such as like Galdem, Kids of Colour, um, Voice, um, Talks of TV, and also Rooted, that people can share their experiences unfiltered and not kind of have like this wall of like, you have to have an academic um, background in writing, you have to have this experience or this network. Um, so I think it's become a, a lot more accessible. Um, I've just forgotten a bit about when you asked about Rooted. <laughs> I've forgotten that last bit of the question. So, do you feel that social media has helped you grow Rooted? 
Yes, and with allies um, as well to help kind of like share on each of us platforms, definitely. Um, for example, like back when um, Black Lives Matter um, protests were happening, um, we launched um, like a, a grant for black artists and uh, another public platform called The White Pube shared it. And then, you know, we instantly got a lot more recognition for that. So it's just about working together and making sure everyone um, kind of like shares the power that they hold as well on social media mm. yeah social media is so much more democratic now and I think for me and my practice and my work it's definitely given me the chance to not feel like I need to get a pat on the back by a bigger institution you know I feel like my work holds value by itself and that's definitely because of social media um Adam, for yourself, he's an academic. Um, so I remember Adam from when, I've, you know, I'm such a big fan <laughs> from Why is the Curriculum So Why, um, NUS, um, National Union of Students. So I was part of the women's campaign. Oh gosh, it feels like so many years ago. And Adam was doing his thing in the movement as well. And I remember like, Why is the Curriculum So Why, like really blowing up on social media. and when you look at your work then being more grassroots social media and your academic work now me being an academic as well how do you like balance the two <laughs> you know it's a difficult one um personally for me um academia is my kind of my day job right it's what pays my bills um but it's not i think it's not what i consider to be the most important kind of political work that I do and I think that participating in conversations like this where I can have conversations that engage with community organizations or arts institutions and um, and or political campaign groups I think are really crucial um, for academics to do because not everyone wants to read a textbook or a journal article right um, and so I think having those kinds of conversations um, and doing those works within our communities um, where we can share information and reflect on our histories but also crucially try to be useful right and uh, so i you know even though i work at university nine to five i spend a lot of time running workshops in fe colleges or youth centers and that kind of thing running um you know little sessions on what to do if you're stopped and searched by the police or what to um or how to how to make complaints against following police harassment or misuse of power um, or running educational workshops for young people in the local area as well so i think it's really i think for me it's really about not make, making academia the beginning and end of the political work that we do, um, but making it one part of, uh, I think, a, a wider conversation um, and appreciating that knowledge isn't just produced at the university, but it's actually produced everywhere um, as well. And that leads really well, great, to the next question around voices. So um, whose voices were heard at the time of the 2011 riots and what's happened to the discourse since 2011? Um, do you feel that the that time has been proper, properly analysed and discussed or do you feel like it's been put on the back burner? And I direct that question to Leeway, um, you again, Adam, and Nika. Yeah, I think <clears throat> the phrase swept under the carpet comes to mind and that once it's no longer... Uh, Pulp fiction news media get swept under the carpet. The issues get swept under the carpet. And we just move on to the next sensational distraction that the government and the right wing press want to put in front of people. I think personally, the important thing is that, yeah, young people, because it is always young people who are in the front line. It's always young people who are being dragged off the street. It's always young people. You know, I'm 60 now. I'm not, uh, I've never thrown a petrol bomb. I've never thrown a rock. I've never been involved in a disturbance. And uh, to be truthful, I would avoid a disturbance like the plague other than to be there, photographing and taking pictures 
because the camera has been my weapon of choice. Thank you, Leroy. Should we look at some of the photos that you have taken? Is this a good time? If Louis wants to start the slideshow. So these are some works by Leroy. Um, are we able to... Could we go back to the last one? Uh, it's going a bit fast, yeah. Yeah, go back to the the Boris statements. Okay. So whilst they're um, just working on the PowerPoint, um, Nika, can I ask you, what do you think, how do you think 2000 in the 2011 um, riots and the uprisings have been memorialized in the public realm and in the art world. Um, I think you're on mute. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, I think that's an interesting one. I think to kind of think, when I was thinking earlier, I thought about the Single Equality Act that came about in 2010 and this was all about ensuring that all these different um, equality legislation, so women's rights, um, and gender equalities, disability, et cetera, race equality, were sort of framed in a way where people could understand them and actually use them and they would be useful and that you could even use them to, you know, to, to challenge people. And so this was a huge, what, what, a huge win for race equality activists was actually making institutional racism unlawful. And it was something they really fought for. And it was Jack Straw did a bit of a U-turn um, when he initially said they would go for it. And then in the Queen's speech um, some years earlier, he'd, he'd sort of, it, he'd signaled that it was not going in that direction. And because of the public outcry, because the public knew more about, um, knew more about institutional racism off the back of the um, McPherson um, report that was for Stephen Lawrence, that they, um, they, they made it unlawful. So people felt like, you know, we're on our way. And then in April, 2011, the equal, Equality, equality schemes were supposed to be in place in these big government institutions. Conservative government turned it all around. They basically took away the powers of the Equalities and Human Rights Commission. And I talked to this because we, I was working at the Arts Council at the time and we really relied on this equality law to kind of, to kind of persuade or force in some cases, uh, the arts organizations that we were funding to ensure that they were doing what they needed to do. So create conditions that were more equitable and more accessible for all, but also start to put the right things um, in place. But when the Conservative government came in, what they said is they said, oh, you don't need all this red tape. You don't need to do equality impact assessments. That, that, was, that was the tool that was used to ensure that any funding or any decisions around funding to do with the arts and other areas um, people thought about what impact does it have on black people, on working class, on disabled people, and then said, this is how we're going to address these challenges. But this didn't, of course, um, happen too rigorously because it, the Conservative government came in. And I, I will, I'll dare you to really go deep and find, look for this red tape challenge. You barely find it. And what they did is they called it the red tape challenge and said, but we know that institutions are grown up. They, they know what they're doing. They don't need us to sit over them and this whole thing of nanny state and basically pulled away the powers of the Equality and Human Rights Commission. And at the time, um, Trevor Phillips was the, um, the chair. And um, they reinstated powers recently with some really interesting people at the top of the organization. And the first person they prosecuted since 2000, and I think 11, was Jeremy Corbyn when they said that he was anti-Semitic 
we hadn't seen anyone being prosecuted in all those times because they just literally stripped the, the Equality and Human Rights Commission of their powers. We were quite deflated at the Arts Council, what those of us that were leading on equality and diversity, because you think you put all this work into trying to get these organizations to be on side. And in the backdrop of all of this, of what happened with the murder of Mark Dugan was this sort of challenge and debate and tug of war that was happening with policymakers, activists, and people within the arts world that were trying to kind of make it fairer and more equitable. So that's a kind of a bit of a long-winded response, but at the time, Arts Council had invested about 10 million, coming close to 10 million um, for African, Asian, and Caribbean artists to try and readdress the balance. So you had this going on in the institution, but the legislation around it was not really supporting it. So what eventually happened sort of by 2012, a lot of the programs led by black people, Decibel and the cultural leadership program, both just disappeared. There was no follow-up, there was no legacy program like other programs, they just literally disappeared. And you felt like it was this legislation backup that it decided that oh, we don't need to get political anymore. And so we just lost it. I wouldn't say we lost the fight because I think a lot of the work evolved into other things, but it, at the time it was incredibly deflating to do all that work and feel that it wasn't continued in some kind of way. So what you do see is you see with the Black Lives Matter though, watching the Arts Council now, I think there was an absolute terror with some of the leadership there, not all of them. I think they are going to be a lot more full on in terms of ensuring that organizations do what they're supposed to do in terms of um, e diversity and equality. So it'll be interesting. I think the proof will, it will come out next, I think next year when they make the decisions on who they fund, I think it's going to be interesting. Well, you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> I was saying thank you so much, Nika. And it's really refreshing to have that take on the art world at that time. It's actually a perspective that I've never really heard. Or um the yeah, it's definitely a perspective I haven't actually heard about. So thank you so much. Fazia, um yourself as a young um curator, how do you see your interactions with public institutions at the moment? And you know, using um, or institutions maybe using you for your identity? Well, you know what, like since, since graduating university, um, I've been lucky enough like through winning like some awards um, and knowing a few people that within institutions, that's been quite easy for me personally to kind of like um, talk to people, introduce ideas, suggest workshops. Um, but there is one particular instance which like might be aware of um that we were invited to a gallery quite um last minute for black history month they hadn't previously planned anything um and then we did five days of unpaid work um and like in that particular gallery it's usually um the audience is quite white but then when we were there and we were doing zine workshops and everything um it you know it wasn't it was like you know diverse so um in regards to kind Kind of like being used and, and you know being a pawn of like tokenism and um, it's still still very very active i think because that only happened a couple of years ago and um, now i've kind of got a more of a sharper eye and um, i can kind of tell like okay are you doing this for the right reasons have you planned this properly you know in regards to proposals um so yeah i think my eyes literally just went like five days unpaid right um, yeah, and we were naive at the time as well, because we thought like, oh my God, it's a massive gallery, it's going to be great for people, people of colour are going to feel comfortable within a gallery space. And then we realised after like, oh, actually, oh, okay, that wasn't good at all. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, Adam, picking up on Nika's points around public policies and laws, I was wondering like, if you could talk about how joint enterprise was used during 2011. So uh, for people who are not familiar with joint enterprise, it's a legal doctrine. Uh, so it's not really a law 
um, it's, it's more of a convention, which enables um, the courts to prosecute somebody for an offence that they haven't committed because they have considered them to be associated with that offence. Um, so th the first time it's ever used is actually back in the 19th century where two people are having a chariot race with each other, or not a chariot, but a horse-drawn carriage race with each other. And they're having this horse-drawn carriage race, and in the process, um, they, they trample over somebody and kill them. And it's unsure who in the chariot, who in the horse-drawn carriage race actually trampled over the person and killed them. So they're both uh, tried and convicted with manslaughter. So what the government have done, they've taken this thing from uh, back in the in the 19th century and now apply it today. And the way in which it's used is by saying that multiple people should be convicted of a murder um, or another another serious offence because the police say they're part of the same gang. Now how the police determine who is and who isn't part of the same gang is partly where a lot of the problems arise because the, the police use quite spurious evidence to determine who is and who isn't part of the same gang. They might show a, a photograph on social media where all the young people are on in their local account to a state or in their local park or in some other social venue and say, look, they're all in the photograph together. They must be part of the same gang. Or they might put up social media and say, look, these people are all in the same music video together. They make music together. This means they must be part of the same gang. So they'll put all of this evidence together and say, right, this serious offence has taken place. It might be a riot related offence, um, which uh, David Cameron blamed on gangs and gang culture, or it might be an, another serious offence. And even if one person has been convicted, if the police can prove through social media and other um, forms of uh, evidence um, that an, another set of young people are all part of the same gang as this young person, they can all be convicted of that same offence. So you've got quite often children, very, very more often than not young people, serving 10, 20 years in prison, not for committing an offence, but because the police have proven to the courts um, that they are part of the same gang as somebody who has committed an offence. And perhaps people are watching this won't be very surprised that it's the majority of people incarcerated using this power are young black and Asian men. And so, what this power did was enabled not only the courts during the riots of 2011 to incarcerate far more people far more quickly for riot related offences, even if they couldn't prove that they personally had done something themselves, but has also enabled the police to continue to use this power in what David Cameron called his all out war on gangs and gang culture. And it's led to a massive expansion, not only in young people being incarcerated generally, but young black men in particular being incarcerated in this country. Thank you, Adam. That was such a strong and excellent explanation. Um, I absolutely hate the Droids Enterprise Law. Um, I think it's probably alongside um, the numerous stop and searches and it's just another tool of the state to definitely marginalise young and Black boys on the street, young black and brown children on the street. Um, I think, like you said, the police know that they're able to just round up a group of young black men and um, essentially arrest them for one crime and get just that, you know, we've done our jobs, they're going to all go to prison for five years. Um, Leroy, I was wondering if you would like to talk about your experiences with the police and how you have had to navigate since the incident um, in 1981. Yeah, well, obviously, I found myself on television, front page of newspapers, and just basically being castigated. I was then held on remand, and I said, remember, I've, uh, I've never thrown a petrol bomb. I've never charged on any police officer. I've never been actively involved in any misdemeanor around writing or uprising. And then I realized that employment opportunities were going to be somewhat limited. Liverpool, because of its history, former history as a transatlantic slave port there is an ingrained institutional racism here there's a 
colour bar in employment here. I once I went from Liverpool to Birmingham via the National Express bus station. When I got to Birmingham, I was shocked at the diversity of employee people at the bus station, whereas in Liverpool, it was a totally white experience. You might have had a token person, but it was almost like it was a different company with different policies because whatever was operating in Birmingham was definitely not operating in Liverpool. So in terms of manoeuvring through police and the aftermath, I then started to do stand-up poetry and uh, the photography, which led to programmes like Panorama, stuff on Channel 4. I had a quite distinctive look about me as well. I'll just take my hat off because I've kind of returned to my 1984-85 short locks, shape at the side kind of a thing. This, in a way, was a double-edged sword. I was very distinctive, so I couldn't really get up to anything unsavoury. But it also meant that, yeah, I was easily recognisable. So I'd, I would have incidents of, let's say I did Panorama or something on Channel 4, and I'd be out with my camera going about the streets, and a van would just roll past, and a window would just get wound down, and they would just say, so you on TV last night, Leroy. And they drive off, which is very intimidating. Because what they're saying is, we know who you are. We can stop you anytime we want. You're starting to talk a talk and you're starting to walk a walk. Don't forget, we're always here for you. And so over the years, I've, you know, stepped like I was in a minefield. But as I said, I'm older now, wiser. I fear for the younger ones who are still at the mercy of being criminalized by police forces who are still being stop and searched predominantly more than anybody else, who are still being framed and fitted up more than anybody else. As I said, you know, I think younger people, they are really in the front line. I'm an old man now. I'm 60. I'm not as um, rebellious or truculent in an active way. That's why I said, for me, my art is my activism. Photography is my activism. And that's how I navigate by being out of sight but having a, a presence through social media and being active and promoting my work through social media. And as I said, sidestepping a lot of uh, confrontational activity with the police. Thank you, Leroy. I think that it's really interesting because we've spoken a lot about how social media has aided like political uprisings, but we haven't actually spoken about how social media has also made the role of an activist or someone who's been part of police brutality like yourself. I feel like if what had happened to you happened now to you, you would have probably gathered a large following on social media. You would have become sort of the face of that kind of movement. And you would have probably got inadvertently some of the benefits that come along with that, whether positive or not. Um, but there's definitely like this kind of influencer activism that's happening. Um, and I think this is a really great time to look at your work um again and then we will move on to audience questions yeah this was a, a march in the aftermath of the 1981 experience maybe 84 85 but the spirits of 
activism was there. But not too long after this, it felt as though our community suddenly was flooded with class A drugs and in an environment where there was little employment opportunities. It was a great divide and conquer mechanism as well as chemical warfare against the whole generation. I said, recently we've had Black Lives Matters uh, marches and they have garnered a certain amount of support. But I personally felt that, yeah, there's been a lack of activism. But as I said, I think it's a generational thing. There are always young people, but those people who suddenly find, well, look, you know, I've got a mortgage, uh, I'm employed, I, I don't want to risk uh, confrontation, I don't want to get arrested on the front line. They've got too much to lose to be involved in activism. Like, for example, have any of you been arrested on the front line of an event or a situation? So I was arrested. <laughs> um, if we go back to the all person's view, so I was arrested in <laughs> in 2000. Adam's laughing. So me and Adam were arrested together <laughs> in 2000. And, I want to say 2016. I was in my last year of uni. I think it was 2015. I remember it being winter. It was bare cold and they were holding oh, us listen, for time. <laughs> listen, we got kettled outside um, Westfield in White City um, after going on a Family United march. And then um, there was a bit of civil disobedience in Westfield, whatever. I don't know. I wasn't there. <laughs> but um, we had been kettled outside for, I think it was like two hours. And then we were mass arrested and taken to, I actually forgot about that, but we, I was taken to a police station very far away from my house. And I had my dissertation due in like the week after. <laughs> I remember just, I actually remember going home and my laptop was on with like the sentence that I had finished writing when I ran down to Westfield to see like what was happening. And then like not wanting to leave and like really be part of that protest. But um, yeah, that was that was a very, and I remember Adam being like, can you shut up please? You're talking too much. <laughs> Do you remember? Because I was just like gobbing off like, and you were just like, be like, allow it. <laughs> I was just trying to de-escalate the situation. I was trying to de-escalate the situation. <laughs> In 2003, I had a, motor offence and I had to go and do a preliminary probation report in the main court in Liverpool and when I went there there was a folder on the desk and I saw my name on it and I asked the woman I said what's that she said oh it's it's your police record I said oh could I have a look because you know they say after 10 years they're supposed to certain things get wiped or removed. But obviously I found out, yeah, you know, age they climbed over a wall, broke windows in a glass house. Da, 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 da. But I found something totally unsavory that had been planted on my record that anybody doing a, a CRB check would instinctively go, hmm, I don't think we'll go there. And this was, as I said, planted and had been there for years. And every time I'd applied for jobs, because as standard now, they do CRB checks, even in the most innocuous of employments, especially, I suspect, if you're black. So there was something on my, planted on my criminal record that would be an automatic, the computer says no, in terms of, gain and employment. So that was a very specific attempt by the powers that be to put hurdles in my path to deter my progress in life. And I'm going, other than seeing it there on that table that day, I wouldn't have known that there was something on your criminal record that has been planted 
that has nothing to do with me. But any anybody looking will go, oh no. No, I don't I think we'll we'll, we'll avoid him. And that's why I said so. These are the depths and the techniques that the establishment will go to to hinder you and try and slow you down, especially as I said, after I'd done panorama and especially after you'd, you'd spoken up on other programs to the extent where a man who shall remain nameless came to where I lived and said to me, oh, some journalists want to speak to you. But, you know, when you see a particular person, you just know nothing good can come from you. So, any, so I'm automatically suspicious if you are going to be the person introducing me to them. I went to the meeting and uh, I've met journalists before. And the one thing I know about journalists is that they use shorthand. And at some point in this interview with them, I said, can I just have a look at what you've written down to make sure you know, you're getting it correct, what I'm saying. And everything was written in longhand. And I knew immediately, these are not journalists. These are a special squad of police that come and investigate certain types of characters. So when, for example, back in the day, um, the miners' union got infiltrated by undercover police officers to keep tabs on the miners' union, we've had recent cases of undercover police officers who've engaged in sexual liaisons, have had children with activists that they've been spying on and never told them. They were completely unaware that, yeah, the guy you've had a baby to is an undercover special branch police officer. So the depths of how they can mess with you and, can, and impinge on your life are, are, are quite unbelievable. Um, um, I just wanted to pick up on the last point Leroy made. Um, I remember really distancing myself around 2018 or maybe 16, 2016, 17 from the mainstream kind of activist student union movement, BLM movement that we were in because of the infiltration of police in the movement. And I remember many of us at that time were like really like, uh, it broke a lot of friendships. Um, I just remember it really changed. As the movement was getting stronger, it really, really changed. And I had friends, Leeway, who were um, impacted by police officers pretending to be boyfriends. And I was wondering, Adam, at the time, if you had to give anyone advice about how to deal with it um, on a legal sense. So obviously I'm not a lawyer, so I wasn't giving people um, too much legal advice, but certainly uh, two of the organisations I was working with, um, we found out that there were uh, undercover uh, police inside our organisations. One was the Newer Monitoring Projects, um, like an organisation in East London that I'd been working with 2012, 2013. Um, and the other one was when I was working at the time, which was called the Monitoring Project, for whom a lot of the people there used to be part of the Stephen Lawrence campaign. We found out that both the Stephen Lawrence campaign and um, the Newer Monitoring Project had been infiltrated by undercover police officers. I remember going into the offices of the monitoring group and the atmosphere was just horrible. Right? It, made, it makes for a really, a really kind of quite paranoid, to be honest, atmosphere to know that you have been infiltrated in the past and there could still be undercover officers working in the office, working upstairs, working downstairs, um, uh, working in adjacent organisations. And it made it, re it made it, it made doing the work that we do, which was already difficult work, right? So we, the monitoring group um, helps to take cases um, against the police, people, black people and Asian people who have experienced police brutality or racial violence, right? So it's already quite traumatizing work that we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And to make, to add e even more weight to that kind of work, we're not only looking over our shoulder about what are the police trying to do, what the police trying to do when we're out in the streets doing what we're trying to do, but we're also worried about them being undercover in our offices and in our community spaces. Um, in our other campaign groups as well. So it was, it made for a really, really difficult work. And But what, what I can say is that what came out of challenging, finding out about these revelations was that for the first time ever, we saw a broad-based leftist coalition against the police and the state. So, um, so the Spy Cops campaign 
brought together black organizations and other anti-racist groups alongside environmental campaigners, trade union groups, loads of different campaign groups, all of whom were united by the fact that they had been infiltrated by the state. And we saw this broad based coalition i would not seen in a long time, really, in my life, my short life, um, really coming up and confronting the police um, and the state because they had actually been brought together by this quite insidious um, and damaging uh, form of um, covert policing. Thank you. Um, does anyone have anything else to add before we move on to audience questions? I just want to add that um, actually with um, the Stephen Lawrence inquiry with the Ms. Fixon report, we thought he was due to release it um, to the public, the police actually broke into his office and got hold of the report. So he started to have a different, he was a quite a conservative um, um, judge and he was someone that who, who had quite conservative views and that whom, when he was appointed to the Lawrence inquiry, they thought he's a safe pair of hands and he started to see all sorts of things that were going on and became, right up until his death, he became someone who was really an activist in terms of, you know, racial injustice, police, brutality, that sort of thing, because he saw it through a different lens when he was dealing with the Stephen Lawrence inquiry, which we all know we've never really got to the bottom of. So yeah, his offices were broken into, yeah. Thank you, I didn't know that. Um, yeah. yeah, I did know that um, there was a doctor um, who, or I don't even know if they were a doctor, but there was someone sent into, in the, I think it was the early 80s, and um, they were sent into like watching police recruitment and all of that. Um, and they were beaten up, their work was erased or deleted, um, destroyed. Because I'm saying deleted like it was a laptop, they didn't really have laptops then, but their work was destroyed. So I think what we're seeing is this like coercive effort, constant effort by the police in instead of trying to create an anti-racist sort of policing strategy, they are just trying to cover, I don't even know if police can ever be anti-racist, but, <laughs> but they definitely can be better, but they're not even trying to do that. They're just constantly trying to cover up what they're doing. Um, yeah. Isn't, I don't there, isn't there a senior, of black police officer, a woman who is now being prosecuted and is experiencing the full weight of the force against her when I presume previously, you know, she yeah, worked yeah. along with it, but now it's against her. I don't know if anyone's got any, yeah, so knows she, any background to that. Yeah, she was, um, she's a highly decorated police officer um and she rose to like the top of the ranks and she was recently prosecuted for um getting sent in decent images via whatsapp that she claims that she never opened um and then i don't there was a, a kind of check and then she got sat um and all of the kind of embarrassments that come along go along beside it however there was many um campaigns launched um, even by, I want to say judges, I'm not quite sure, I, I kind of stopped following the story, but there, um, I do know that she got reinstated, um, I don't know what that means for her career fully, but it does mean if she was to retire, she will get her pension, um, and I think that's probably what she was thinking. Um, I, I don't think she's being reinstated, I think she's still under prosecution, and she's basically still under threat of being thrown out of the force with no pension and basically as a black woman who's again because obviously she's raised racism as part of the reason why she's being treated the way she is and gender and they are just completely prepared to do anything to whitewash it to use such a phrase but the reason why I'm in because yeah, you, sometimes you just don't realize the full apparatus of the state and how deeply entrenched these racist views are that they feel are perfectly normal and acceptable and that anyone who objects to them is a snowflake and a Twinkie. And they've got no intention of giving up one iota 
of what they view to be their privileged position. And they do not want to see people like us actively trying to dismantle their racist foundation and trying to engage and, and educate the wider masses of people to be aware of the right-wing agenda through the press, so on and so on and so forth. Yeah, definitely. Um, are there any audience questions? So um, <clears throat> we don't have any come through the, the Q&A um, at the moment, but if anyone has any, then there is a little um, tab um, just at the bottom. So it's just next to, there's a uh, button that says raise hand and just next to that there's Q&A. Um, and you can uh, pose questions there. Um, if you're struggling with that, then then um, do just use the chat function as well. I'll keep an eye on that. Um, but to start us off, I mean, I guess I'd also just like to express sort of real gratitude to the to the panel because um, I think that was a really thoughtful discussion um, that covered like such a wide range of kind of ground, but also like brought up raised so many kind of interesting points. Um, a lot of them are kind of quite fearful points. I think especially. Um, you know, moments where um, where uh, politicians are kind of uh, feels like they're moving the goalposts of kind of um, laws that have been kind of fought for, or um, introducing new laws that that make um, that make life really difficult and make any sort of political engagement um, quite difficult. Um, so there's a lot in there that that I'm thinking. You know, this is there's a lot of stuff that's really kind of yeah, very very kind of frightening, I guess. Um, and kind of adding to that, I suppose, Leroy, what you were kind of saying about um, about young pe people being kind of fearful um, to actually kind of take to the streets and kind of risk risk arrest, and that you know life is very precarious at the moment. People have a lot to kind of um, uh, to kind of risk. Um, kind of adds to that. But then I was kind of thinking about the BLM protests last summer, and thinking that actually those taking part in a place where um, technology and being able to kind of communicate digitally is it's most kind of easy as it's, it's ever been. Um, you know, we're doing this, this kind of panel purely online tonight. Um, and yet even in a pandemic where there was actually a risk that you could get sick in kind of, um, you know, a, a crowded sort of public space, people did still, um, you know, take to the streets and people did still kind of engage. Um, so there's also kind of quite a lot of kind of hopefulness um, and also thinking between 2011 and, and um, the more recent BLM protests of just kind of going back to that question of um, the identity of activism and whose voices are being heard, just thinking about how many more voices are in the public domain than back in 2011, where following, um, you know, one of, the, one of the, the nights of unrest, you had David Starkey, who's a, a specialist in Tudor history, being interviewed. And it's like, what is, you know, what is that all about? And then he says what he says, which I'm not going to um, repeat or go into. But now when you think of kind of all of the authors in, in kind of mainstream public discourse um, since that point, there feels like there's some hope as well. So that's a very long winded way of me kind of circling back. And I, what I want to ask um, the panelists is um, what are the things that you're fearful about um, and what are the things you're hopeful about um, in relation to where we are now? So maybe, Adam, do you want to start? Sure, so um, let's start with the fearful and then end with something a bit more positive. Eh? So I guess what I'm fearful about is the fact that despite the massive protests that we saw in 2020, uh, this current government has made it very clear that it is, that it is going to double down on its authoritarianism, on its violence, on its, on its exploitation, and of course, on its racism. So we can see this, of course, through the embarrassment that was uh, the uh, Commission for Racial and Ethnic Disparities, where they found their, um, uh, you know, cherry-picked group of conservative Black and Asian, uh, I don't even know if I'd go as far as calling them researchers, I, I mean, but people, um, uh, uh, to put together um, a report which, yeah, I won't, let's not even go into, but which the bottom line is denies institutional racism despite the reams of evidence of its existence. Um, but also the fact that following those protests in 2011, we also, oh, sorry, in, in 2020, we of course also have seen the expansion of police powers, right? So whether it be the new uh, police crime and evidence um, and sentencing bill, or whether it be 
uh, the the use of uh, the expansion of um, a whole heap of other police powers, including most recently uh, the use of what's called Section 60, which enables the police to um, not need reasonable suspicion to carry out a stop and search. The very same um, uh, policing practice, which was used in the two years which led up to the 2011 riots, and of course, very famously, also was the policing practice which led up to the uprisings of 1981. And so, this government is quite has been quite has been quite clear in its position i think as to how they want to respond um, to the process of 2020 and it's to double down on re rejecting racism um, at, uh, and any idea of rejecting anti-racism um, and doing anything about it and of course doubling down doubling down on the kinds of policies and practices which actually exacerbate racial injustice and racial inequality but I think there are positive things to think about um, have come out um, that are coming out at the moment i mean it's difficult to not be inspired, of course, by um, the largest anti-racist protests probably in British history, which took place in 2020, right, in, in, in cities up and down the country, but also in a lot of small towns and villages that have never seen anti-racist mobilisations before. But I think what's also important is what the legacies are um, of that, because although um, Black organizations like Black Lives Matter aren't doing the kind of headline grabbing um, actions that took place in the summer of last year. The kind of organizing, the grassroots organizing that's necessary, in, that doesn't necessarily grab the national headlines, but is really crucial and fundamental to building and sustaining a movement is taking place, right? And we're seeing this through things like what's called the Kill the Bill Coalition, where a coalition of youth organizations, uh, women's groups, black organizations, migrant solidarity organizations, uh, trade unions, all of these different groups are coming together to challenge this new uh, crime policing and sentencing and evidence bill. Um, and not only to challenge that particular bill and how it threatens all of our civil liberties in loads of different ways, but also crucially police and power, police power and prison power more generally um, as well. And so we're seeing the kind of legacies of these protests, I think, continually um, uh, coming up in, in different iterations, building uh, links of solidarity with other organisations, which I think spells uh, the potential of, of, of a broad based resistance against what I think is possibly the most authoritarian government that we've seen in this country for a generation. On that point, could I just ask Louis to uh, start the slideshow? Hello. Lucifer, are you there? Um, whilst um, Louis starting the slideshow, oh, okay, it's here. We have the slideshow. Yeah, I think uh, what I would like to see is more organized business empowerment for young people that we start to see young people starting their own enterprises and also looking towards making a reconnection economically, politically and spiritually and culturally with Africa as a way forward in this time, because as I said, the depths of racism and corruption in this country is not going anywhere. It's deeply, deeply entrenched. I haven't got 50 years to wait to see things get better. Our youngest um, member of the panel, you know, you, you, you could turn to be 60 in years to come and find Nothing's really changed. Everything has just been lip service. And really, as I said, they do not want to dismantle their privileges. They see equality as meaning that they are losing something instead of the country gaining a whole new swathe of talented young people who can help build the future of Britain. Thank you, Leroy. Um, Nick Air, um, Adam's question was, what are you most fearful of? Um, and I was wondering if you'd like to answer. 
I think I'm quite fearful of the fact that the rights of the artists, so they've cut funding to a lot of universities for any kind of arts programme. And we know that the artists help to subvert, they help to tell the story, they help to reimagine, they help to communicate quite difficult and complex narratives to the widest possible base. So you can look at artists, the great um, Bob Marley, and you can listen to his songs and you can make it relevant every where you look and every every situation you find yourself in, you can find a Bob Marley song that speaks to it. He's like a prophet, you know. And so you think, I'm, I'm fearful that the, the funding is getting caught and it's all it's always packaged as a bit of a flimsy um, option and not a necessary. And we know that actually most of us have kept going through Netflix, being on social media, TikTok, all these other spaces that allowed us to be creative, fixing our houses, fixing our gardens learning to cook more, all these other spaces that allow you to create and reimagine yourself and reimagine the world. Um, so this is what I'm fearful when we see, we, we're seeing all the cuts that are happening. We're seeing that schools have had funding cuts to the arts for a long time. But I think I'm hopeful, a little bit sort of similar to how Adam is, Adam spoke, is the legacies of this um, Black Lives Matter. Well, a friend of mine, I used to live in New York for a long time, and a friend of mine called me in the middle of the night one night during these Black Lives Matter, sort of like the height of the protests, and said, I hear Black Lives Matter chanting, and she looked out the window and 90% of the marchees or young white kids. And actually, I think when I was in New York, I did a lot of marches and it was mixed, but she said, literally, she's feeling, she's seeing something different. And what I'm seeing differently is people are reading the books that I've read. They're digging a bit deeper. They're not accepting the superficiality. They're understanding things like systemic racism and understanding what it looks like in relation to their contributions and how they can shift that and how they can be more of an ally. And whether it's being kind of like fist up activists or doing things about how you interview, how do you ensure that you get the right people around the table? What things do you need to put in place to ensure that you've got a more diverse mix and is, they've got equal, equal access to opportunities? So you're not stuck like how Lero always said, he couldn't get a job because of certain things that people put on. How do you bypass all of that? What policies do you put into place? So we're beginning to realize that people are having those quite difficult conversations and sticking with it. They're not, you know, melting and sort of saying, I can't do this. And I keep saying to people, look, sometimes it's difficult and other days you find it's a little bit more of a breeze, but this is part of like, if you want to affect change, you have to sometimes be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And this, we've all got used to it because we know that in order to navigate in, a, in certain spaces, you have to just kind of suck it up and, and get on with it. it. It affects one's mental health. But I think the positive side too is that people are beginning to have those mental health conversations whereby they recognize that actually someone being harassed by the police has a hugely knock-on effect um, on one's mental health. I, I remember in New York being stopped and I, was, I had a learner's permit and the police came towards the car because the taillight was out, but I didn't know that. And I went to get my license in the glove compartment and an American friend of mine grabbed my shoulders and said, keep your hands on the steering wheel. And I remember freaking out and he said, you'll get shot and I hold you onto the steering wheel. And then the police came, they hear the English accent, they calm down. And then my friend said, never go to the glove compartment. They're gonna think you've got a gun. And of course, when this whole George Floyd murder came up, it kind of, he called me, I hadn't heard from him in years. And it sort of triggers you and you realize all the things you have to do to survive. But I, th I think, What's been good is people are recognizing that and they're recognizing that actually there needs to be healing. We need to be, sometimes as black people, we need to even be kinder to ourselves. Sometimes we expect ourselves to be tough, tough it through. And sometimes you can't tough it through. You just kind of need to have your, your space to kind of freak out and do whatever you need to do and regather your thoughts. You can't always be strong. So I think this is all these conversations around mental health that's coming up, I think is, is a positive thing. So that's my kind of like full stream of, of, of the good and the, and the bad. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, I think we need to stop looking to our oppressors for funding to help defeat them because nobody's going to give you the tools that you need to dismantle their thing. We have to start working more collectively, whether it's 10 people say, you know what, let's start a corner shop and we'll all chip in towards the rent and we'll do what's required. And, da, 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 da. and someone else might say, well, let's start a gallery. But collectively, someone else might say, well, let's start a taking youths to Gambia project who and start it ourselves and look towards funding from people who would be more sympathetic to us than trying to get money off the Arts Council, who are themselves deeply <clears throat> handcuffed mm. politically by, by the establishment at this very moment in time. As I say, I just think we need more collective efforts. And even though I'm an individual, and I obviously work alone a lot as a photographer, collectively, I'm all there for supportive, collaborative efforts. Yeah, I can't agree with you more, Leroy. Um, last year, I started uh, um, I started an online school, um, and it's basically I had enough of applying to Arts Council. I was just like, every time I want to curate an exhibition, I just have to apply to Arts Council, or I have to find an institution willing to host it. And I think this is what I love so much about um, Bath's current work um, uprise is that it doesn't need an institution to say yes, the artwork exists on the streets, it's for the people. It's very much give, reminded me of a quote by Labena Hamid um, when Labena spoke about taking the art work straight to the streets away from the galleries and the institutions if they're, if they're not necessarily willing to hear us. Um, and I started the school as a way to make sure that I was in financial control of my own creative practice and um, each of the tutors as well. So it was, it's definitely been, um, you know, it's, I can't explain the feeling of being able to pay myself and pay other black creatives and lecturers and all the people that we work with through Black Blossoms um, in order for them to go off and then have a knock on effect for their communities as well, their artistic communities as well. And I always find it really weird. It's a weird place navigating whiteness in these institutions. And I'm probably not as hopeful as Nick Air in thinking these young white people scream, echoing Black Lives Matter are gonna be um, saviors as they get older, because I think there's a lot of consumption of black culture amongst a lot of um, non-black people. And at the time when everyone's saying black lives matter, it's like, yeah, okay, this is the in thing. But, you know, if we were to ask each and every one of these people, how much money have they invested or spent amongst black businesses since the pandemic, um, I'm saying since the pandemic, since last year, I think they might have said, oh, I've done, I done a few things, you know, on a black pound day but you know I think the way for change is via us and through us and yeah and I, I, I also understand the spiritual nature of connecting back with home and I think I'm Nigerian so I have the privilege of being able to just say yeah I'm out I've got a home in Nigeria I don't need to be here but I understand for many it's not like that and I think maybe a part of me has that guilt and that's what keeps me working in Britain. Can I just add something? In terms of the Arts Council, I think it's, I think it's important that you do a mixture of everything in terms mm -hmm. of funding your But that is public money. We've all paid into it. We've got absolute yeah. entitlement to it. So I don't, I'd say to people, don't give up the shifting that's happening where you don't have to align yourself to an institution. That's recent. That was recent as off the back of the pandemic. And um, some of the lessons they've learned off the back of the pandemic is they didn't need four years to come up with a program. They literally turned around this artist, you know, this um, there was a fund that uh, sort of like a rescue fund for artists. Yeah. Many, many black artists who've never had funding in the history of the Arts Council for the first time got funding and felt validated. I think this is taxpayers' money. We've got every right to go for it. But I think it should be the only money that people go after. I think, you, like you said, 
having a combination of doing your own thing, finding new ways to collaborate and, and partner. Absolutely. But let's not knock down that money because we've all paid into it anyway. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with that as well. Um, I've received the Arts Council Emergency Fund and that was the first time I've got something from Arts Council. And in my application, I actually stated that being a single black mum has and never been able to get funded has put me in such a precarious situation during the lockdown do you know what I mean so I definitely agree with you but I also just feel like I just I don't know limited parts I will say look it's limited it's highly competitive do a bit of everything I think everything you said and some but still go after that I mean Bath got his, his funding he did them it must have taken them you know, Althea and Bath, a huge amount of effort to so pull together the funding, but they got funding for such an amazing, interesting, inspiring project that's never really been done before. And that sets the tone for the next way. You know, they, they've got a while to go, but I, I know a couple of people there that are really trying. So don't give up on them yet, because I think we've always got to keep holding them to account too. And I do, I work there, but I still hold them to account. I still pull them out on things and say, what the hell is going, you know, so, what yeah. do you think successful uh, sports people, business people, people in entertainment, black people in entertainment, what they could be doing to, like DeMarcus Rashford, he, I think he has shown what can be achieved, but I'm still waiting for Lenny Henry, Idris Elba, a few other characters... Lenny to really Henry, step up. The, the, Lenny Henry has set up a centre for media diversity to ensure that the, all these things we're talking about, to ensure that the media has more diversity, that the diverse people that aren't marginalised and overlooked and all the things that they go through. He set up this wicked centre that's linked to the City, Birmingham, City University of Birmingham and Cardiff. And they have a magazine that comes out, I think, once a quarter called Representology. And that is really about trying to have these more diverse voices. So I think some of the people we don't know, they're doing stuff behind the scenes. They're, they're sharpening policy and they're fighting from behind the scenes. And some of them are a lot, a lot more vocal. But Lenny Henry's done a lot. He's done a lot. I don't think he was easy early days, but I think now he's more than trying to, to rectify it, you know? Yeah. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, I want to end with um, a political one word to describe or one word to motivate us to stay politically active or two words. <laughs> I don't have two words, but I'm going to start with Bowsia. <laughs> I instantly thought of um, manifesto, um, create manifesto, I guess, two words. Create yeah. manifesto, I like that. Thank you. Uh, uh, Leroy? I would say faith and endurance. You need to have faith in yourself and your brothers and sisters around you. And you need to have a spirit that can endure the slings and arrows that will come at you and know that eventually we all contribute to the legacy of our historical presence in the world. So yeah, faith and endurance. Thank you. Adam? Uh, for me, I think art and culture is really important because it offers us a radical reimagining of the world. So I'd say radical reimagining oh so it's not art and culture it's radical reimagining it's radical reimagining okay. yeah. <laughs> i was getting jealous that i didn't say art and culture <laughs> nick air i'll say that then. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Adam. i think i think i'm thinking of hope i i think hope and i don't like the word resilience but i can't think of the word that i'm trying to find because resilience means that you have to keep going but it's that sense of um actually you we've got to find ways to to build upon um to build 
let, build on lessons learned? How do we just kind of build on it rather than always dwell on it? Because it can, that, can, that energy can drag you down. Thank you. So it's resilience and... Hope. hope. <laughs> I always have hope. <laughs> um, I will end off by saying joy and community. I carry on doing the work that I do because I love, love everyone like that I work with. Like I, I feel honored to even be part of this conversation. So I wanna thank Bath for creating the work and Anthea for creating and working with Bath to create such a pub, amazing public program. I wanna thank each of the panelists here today. I think the community that, this community that we've just created and the communities that you're each a part of and the work that you've done in those communities is really important. And um, I'm sure it's changed many, many, many lives and it will continue to impact many lives. And the joy part comes from the fact that as hard as this work is, as depressed as it, depressing as it, it can be, there's so much joy in us coming together and creating a communion um, together. And I just feel so blessed to be part of the struggle with you all. <laughs>